the cards. Now we are going to move down into the oceans. The oceans are tremendously important to us. They contain food sources like fish and seaweed. They contain minerals that we need. And they contain a biodiversity which is crucial to maintain and which may, for instance, hold new cures to diseases. The oceans are also an important part of the Earth's total ecosystem and can provide us with important information about the state of the Earth, including climate changes. The oceans thus play a key role in addressing our global challenges, stemming from an increasing population and the corresponding need for food, energy and minerals, and for addressing the challenge of global warming. And yet, despite being so crucially important to us, we know more about the surface of the moon than we know about the bottoms of our own oceans. Only 5% of our oceans have been explored. We need to get down there and explore. To get more knowledge about what is happening and to utilize its vast resources in a sustainable manner, protecting biodiversity. So how do we get to the bottom of this? While diving can be wonderful in itself, it can also be dangerous. And also, it's limited how deep divers can go. So therefore, ocean exploration requires marine robots. We have three types of marine robots today. We have survey AUVs, autonomous underwater vehicles, which are made for traveling large distances. They are torpedo-shaped to achieve good hydrodynamic properties making them energy efficient. As you can see, they do not have any manipulator arms, so they cannot interact with the environment, for instance, picking up a sample from the seafloor. If we want to interact with the environment, we use ROVs, remotely operated vehicles. These are vehicles equipped with manipulator arms. The box-shaped carrying vehicle, it is not as hydrodynamically efficient as the survey AUV. So ROVs are better suited for short-range operations. And in addition, the big box, it restricts access. And such an ROV is not able to access narrow spaces, like, for instance, between rocks or inside ice caves. To gain such access, the ROVs are made smaller and smaller. But as you make them smaller and smaller, the arms that they can carry with them also need to be made smaller and smaller. And in the end, we are left with a pure observation ROV, which may look something like this. This robot gives access to narrow spaces, but it has no manipulator arms, so it cannot interact with the environment. So with the current marine robots, we need to choose between a robot that can travel long distances, one which can interact with its environment, or another robot that can gain access to narrow spaces. Since our goal is accessing and exploring the oceans, it can be smart to instead learn from nature. And we here see how sea snakes move efficiently through water. Their body is long and slender, even more so than the survey AUV. And in addition, it's flexible, able to move efficiently through the water and in between rocks and corals. And inspired by this, inspired by nature, my research group has made robotic snakes that mimic these biological snakes. We here see the snake robot, which we named Mamba. It's moving around in water, performing these simple undulations, just like the sea snakes, and we see how efficiently it then moves through the water. 
Lumumba is a demonstrator, a proof of concept showing that it is indeed possible for marine robots to traverse the oceans. To fully understand snake robots, we do what we always do when we want to fully understand a physical system. We build a mathematical model of it. When we develop such a mathematical model, we use pencil and paper and we write page after page after page until we finally understand how the snake robot is behaving. And you may ask, why do we need a mathematical model when we have a physical snake robot like Mamba? And the reason for this is that Mamba is one particular snake robot, and everything that we can learn from observing Mamba and his behavior, the only thing that we know is that this holds for this robot. While this mathematical model here, it describes every snake robot in the world, regardless of whether it is large or small, short or long, whether it's moving on land or swimming in water. Mathematics is a language to understand snake robots, and by analyzing this mathematical model, we can find inherent properties of snake robots and also of biological snakes. And in this way, we use mathematics to decode the secrets of nature. The first research question, the first thing we wanted to understand was, how do we make the snake robot move forward? We here see the snake robot Anaconda. And this was the first water hydraulic snake robot in the world. It moves using the same undulations that we see biological snakes use, but as you can see, it's not moving forward. Using our mathematical model, analyzing this, we find that the reason for this is its smooth surface because in order for undulations to make a snake robot move forward, the robot needs to have a certain friction property. Specifically, the friction in the sideways direction needs to be much higher than the friction in the lengthwise direction. And biological snakes, they have this friction property due to the scales of their skin. And in water, the hydrodynamic drag forces, they provide this property, also without these kind of scales, because of the long and slender body of the snake. So our analysis of the mathematical model tells us that in water, undulations will make the snake robot move forward, as Mamba demonstrates here. And we can have different kinds of undulations, to the left, we see lateral undulation, where the amplitude of the undulation is the same along the whole body of the snake. The amplitude is how far out the robot swings. While to the right, we see eel-like motion, where the head is kept quite still and the amplitude of the undulation increases towards the tail. Knowing then how to make our snake robots move forward, the next question was, how do we make them move forward as fast as we would like? How would, for instance, changing the amplitude affect the forward speed? If we increase the amplitude, would that make the snake robot move faster since it pushes away more water? Or would it make it move slower since it has to move a longer distance in order to move forward? Again, the mathematical model provides the answer. It says that increasing the amplitude will make the snake robot move faster. And actually, doubling the amplitude will not only double the forward speed, but it will make the robot move four times as fast. Having understood how to make the robot move forward and with the speed that we would like, our next research question was, how do we make the snake robot not only move forward, but go exactly where we want it to go? So how make a snake robot follow a desired path? To achieve this, we use something called line of sight control. 
And this is actually what most of us do when riding a bike or a car or any other vehicle where we do not have the opportunity to put on any direct sideways force. We can only control the heading and the forward speed. What we intuitively do then is that we look towards the path that we want to follow. And then we head the bike or the car such that it is oriented towards a point that lies a certain distance ahead of us along this path. This distance is called the look-ahead distance, and it's shown in yellow here. As we approach the path, since this point is always a constant distance ahead of us, the point will also move forward, and by always heading towards this point, will give us a smooth and steady approach towards the path. Our mathematical model, it tells us that this look-ahead distance is important. It needs to be chosen sufficiently large, or else the system becomes unstable. And you may actually already have observed this if you observe inexperienced bikers or drivers who look just ahead of the bike or the car, something which results in a wobbly, unsteady behavior, while a good driver looks far ahead, has a long look-ahead distance. In this experiment here, we have told Mama to follow the yellow path here. And we see how Mamba uses an undulatory motion to move forward. And it keeps a sufficiently large look-ahead distance, such that it moves smoothly towards the yellow path. An additional challenge that the snake robot faces when moving in water is the ocean current. And in this experiment, there is a current in the direction of the green arrows, pushing Mamba away from the path. And Mamba does not know which direction the current comes from or how strong it is. And yet, the algorithms that were built into Mamba, they notice that something is pushing the robot away from the path. And these algorithms automatically adapt the swimming motion to compensate for this. And as we can see, the center of the robot follows the path. So, learning from nature, we have found a robot which moves efficiently through water with a slender and flexible body, which makes it easy to access narrow spaces, like, for instance, between rocks, under eyes, or inside shipwrecks. Mamba cannot stand still in water, however. It cannot hover. If it stops undulating, then the ocean currents will make it drift away. The next research question I wanted to pursue was, why not combine the best from biology and nature with the best from technology? Combining the slender and flexible body of the snakes with thrusters, giving the robot the ability to hover, for instance, to inspect something or to pick something up. And we here see the resulting swimming snake robot produced by the NTNU spin-off company Illum. And here on stage, we can see the real robot. This new bio-inspired robot combines several of the benefits of the existing marine robots into one robot. It's uh, like the Swiss army knife for ocean exploration. It shares the same advantageous hydrodynamic properties as the survey AUV, making it suitable for long-range operations. Its flexible and slender body gives excellent access capabilities compared to even the smallest observation ROVs. It can snake around obstacles and through narrow openings. And the snake-like shape also makes the robot modular, and we can change the combination of joints, thrusters, and payloads. And as it is a dexterous robot manipulator arm, it can have a tool in one or in both ends to interact with this environment, carrying out intervention tasks. So with this bio-inspired robot, we are ready to explore the oceans. 
The robot can move under and inside ice because of the slender and flexible body. And it can take samples since it can hover in water and use the tools at its ends to interact with the environment. The robot can also support aquaculture by inspecting the well-being of the fish and also the state of the nets, detecting and repairing holes to prevent fish from escaping. We have several man-made structures in our oceans, and it is important that these are inspected, maintained and repaired to pose as little disturbance to the ocean ecosystem as possible. The Illum robot here is designed to live permanently at the seafloor, where it can safely operate 24-7 regardless of weather conditions. And since the robot is available at all time, any problem that should arise can be detected and repaired much earlier. So the resident robot gives both greener and safer subsea operations. One of the actors who are dedicated to this is Equinor. And as we speak, one of the Illum robots is swimming around in the Trondheim Fjord, just outside our windows here, getting itself ready to move out to Equinor's Oscar field, where it will work as a janitor this summer. And I will show a short video showing how the Illum robot will work at the Oscar field to achieve greener and safer subsea operations. So with this new bio-inspired marine robot, we are ready to explore the remaining 95% of our oceans. Thank you.